Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 18th lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. In the last lecture, okay, we have discussed, I mean we started this module on synthesizing modernity and social theory through the contributions made by Emmanuel Wallerstein, Anthony Giddens and Jürgen Habermas. To begin with, we have just started with the works of Immanuel Wallerstein's contributions to, to uh, the critical modernist paradigm in sociology. I mean, we have discussed the modern world system, how Wallerstein's modern world system has been influenced by uh, Karl Marx, uh, the proponents of dependency theory, including Andre Gunder Frank and, and French historian uh, Fernand Brodeur, okay? and, and how he, yeah, how Wallerstein uh, even at the time of Cold War, how uh, Wallerstein was looking at, was anticipating uh, uh, the final north-south conflict, I mean the conflicts between the northern hemisphere on the one hand and southern hemisphere on the other, how he rejects the notion of a third world, claiming that there is only one world connected by a complex network of economic exchange relationships, that is a world economy or a world system in which the dichotomy of capital and labor and the incessant, the never ending, the endless uh, accumulation of capital by, by competing agents account for frictions and this approach is known as the world systems theory. Okay. How uh, Wallerstein uh, tried to foreground the problematic of core periphery by bringing about uh, 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 a zone called called semi periphery okay i mean there is a fundamental and institutionally stabilized division of labor between core and periphery while the core has a high level of technological development and manufactures complex products the role of the periphery is to supply raw materials uh, agricultural products and cheap labor force for the expanding agents of the core okay i mean uh, it is based on international division of labor, it is, it is based on the improved modes of production. Okay. And, and such economic exchange between core and periphery takes place on unequal terms. The periphery is forced to sell its products at low, low prices, but has to buy the core's products at comparatively high prices. This unequal state which once established tends to stabilize itself due to inherent quasi deterministic constraints. And, and, and the way Wallerstein foregrounded that, that uh, the, the statuses of core as well as periphery are not mutually exclusive and fixed or given uh, to certain geographical areas, instead they are relative to each other and, and they keep on shifting. Okay? There is a zone called semi-periphery which acts as a periphery to the core and a core to the periphery. Okay? And, and one effect of such expansion of the world system is the continuing commodification of things including human labor, human individual, I mean human self okay, and so on. And natural resources, land, labor and human relationships are gradually being st stripped of their intrinsic value and turned into commodities in a market which dictates their exchange value. Everything is bought and sold on the market okay, including uh, human beings, human labor and so on. Okay. And, and the way uh, Wallerstein uh, brought about a critique to uh, uh, Eurocentric uh, structures of knowledge by, by uh, making a case in favor of subjugated knowledge forms, subjugated forms of knowledge, okay. by arguing that, that, uh, that uh, the US is a hegemon in decline. Uh, in fact, he mentioned this in 1980 when the second volume of 
the modern world system was published. Okay. He was often mocked for making this claim during the 1990s, especially um, in the aftermath of uh, the debacle of socialism in the erstwhile USSR. But since the Iraq war, Wallerstein's argument has become more widespread, more popular and he is more acceptable uh, and he has also consistently argued that the modern world system has reached its end point. Wallerstein believes that the next 50 years or so uh, will be a period of chaotic instability which will result in a new system, one which may be more or less egalitarian than the present one. In this context, in the present lecture, in this lecture what we are going to discuss I mean the way Wallerstein's theory has also provoked harsh criticism, not only from neoliberal uh, circles, but also from conservative circles. Neoliberal circles when I say, I mean those who pr promote the ideas of liberalization, privatization and globalization and when I say conservative circles, okay, I mean those who followed, uh, those who followed a more orthodox model of development, conservative model of development. But even some historians who have averred that some of his assertions may be historically incorrect. As well, some critics suggest that Wallerstein tends to neglect the cultural dimension, reducing it to what some call official ideologies of the state, which can then easily be revealed as mere agencies of economic interest. Nonetheless, Wallerstein's analytical approach along with that of associated theorists such as Andre Gunder Frank, I mean the, the, the main proponent of dependency theory, okay, Terence Hopkins, Samir Amin, okay, uh, Walden Bellow, uh, Amartya Sen, Prabhat Patnaik, uh, Uchha Patnaik, uh, Amyo Kumar Bagchi, um, um, Christopher uh, Chais Dunn and, and Giovanni uh, Aragi, um, I mean I mean such such approach has made a significant influence and, and established an institutional base devoted to the general approach and, and it has also attracted strong interest from the anti-globalization movement. That is why we, we always look at uh, we always tend to look at World Social Forum, uh, um, World Economic Forum and so on, um, even, even SN Social Forum uh, we all have seen uh, in, in numerous places, even in India. When we then what did Wallerstein refer to when he tried to develop a capitalist world system? The, the way Wallerstein tried to reflect on the capitalist world system in terms of the dichotomy between labor and capital, in terms of the, the, the way world economic development has taken place through various stages starting with hunting and gathering economy, the slave society, uh, the feudal society and the capitalist society and so on okay. and the endless accumulation of capital, okay. how capital is labor displacing. Okay. I mean this is how Wallerstein tried to uh, capture the modern world system, the capitalist world system and such, such, such definition of Wallerstein follows dependency theory which intends to combine the developments of the different societies from the 16th century in different regions into one collective development. And the main characteristic of Wallerstein's definition is the development of a global division of labor, international division of labor including the existence of independent political units, for example, states at the same time. And there is no political center compared to global empires like the Roman Empire. Instead, the capitalist world system is integrated on the world market. Okay? That is why more than political integration, more than cultural integration, okay. Wallerstein was more interested, was more emphatic on, on the way different countries are economically integrated into a single unified whole. 
Th that's how he he tried to Wallerstein tried to capture the process of globalization. Okay, that that the capitalist world system is integrated on the world market. Okay, which is divided into three forms. Okay, three spaces, three ideologies, three economic structures, namely the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery, and is ruled by the capitalist method of production, whether it is developed countries or um, developing countries or absolutely underdeveloped countries, okay, they tend to follow the capitalist method of production. And the ideal type of market for in, in, in present day world is, is capitalism. When we discuss the, the position of core and periphery and their, their position and, and the position of both core and periphery in the context of another zone called semi periphery defines the difference between developed countries and developing countries characterized by power or wealth characterized by improved mode of production when i say mode of production it is a combination of both forces of production as well as relations of production the core stands or the core refers to uh, developed countries and the periphery is a synonym for the dependent developing countries, perennially dependent underdeveloped countries. The main reason for the position of the developed countries is economic power, because they control world market, world military. Okay. And semi periphery, it defines states that are located between core and periphery, they benefit from the periphery through unequal exchange relations. At the same time, the core benefits from the same periphery through unequal exchange relations. That is why I gave you in the last lecture, I gave you the example of uh, the position of India. Suppose. India is a periphery to the European Union, India is a periphery to the United States of America, but India becomes a core to a country like Ghana, I mean African country such unequal exchange relations. For Wallerstein, some, some 50 years ago, okay, what was the meaning of modern, of the term modern? For Wallerstein, the term modern had two clear connotations. First, modern signified the most advanced technology. When I said modern, when I say modern, in, in terms of, I mean Wallerstein, uh, I mean one of the connotations, not absolutely okay first modern signified the most advanced technology modern was situated in a conceptual framework of the presumed endlessness of technological progress and therefore of constant innovation this modernity was in consequence a fleeting modernity what is modern today will be outdated tomorrow what is technology today may not remain a technology tomorrow. It is fleeting modernity. It is, I mean, it, it changes. Okay? Once upon a time, floppy, the way we used to uh, use, we were using floppy. Okay? That was a part of technological innovation. People used to say that, no, we can save our, store our data and so on. But now, nobody uses floppy. That is, that is, that which was modern some 20 years ago is no longer uh, a modern feature today. Okay. That is the first one. The second one, the second major connotation to the concept of modern, one that was more oppositional than affirmative, which negates more than accepts. One could characterize this other connotation less as forward looking than uh, as militant and also self-satisfied, less material than ideological. To be modern uh, signified to be anti-medieval in an antinomy to in which uh, the concept medieval incarnated narrow-mindedness, dogmatism and above all the constraints of authority. Okay. Presumptive triumph of human freedom against the forces of evil and ignorance a trajectory of, of progressive 
uh, or a trajectory as progressive as that of technological advance. But it was not a triumph of humanity over nature, it was a triumph of humanity over itself or over those with privilege. Its path was not one of intellectual discovery, but of social conflict. This modernity was not the modernity of technology, rather the, the modernity of liberation. If you look at this modernity of liberation, okay, then one is fleeting modernity. Now, we are looking at modernity of liberation. One is modern modernity of technology and the other is modernity of liberation. If, if that modernity of technology refers to fleeting modernity, now, now the what kind of modernity of liberation will bring about. Okay? If, if it is modernity of liberation of, of substantive democracy, okay, the rule of the people as uh, opposed to that of the aristocracy, okay, I mean of substantive democracy of human fulfillment. This modernity was not a fleeting modernity, but an eternal modernity. If modernity of technology is, uh, 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 is fleeting modernity, is a, is a fleeting modernity, then modernity of liberation is an eternal modernity. Once achieved, it was never uh, uh, to be yielded. The, the two stories, the two discourses, the two searches, the two quests, the two modernities were quite different, even contrary one to the other. They, they were also, however, historically deeply intertwined one with the other, such that there was there has resulted deep confusion, uncertain results, and much disappointment and disillusionment. Okay. What are those two stories, two discourses, two quests, two searches, two modernities? One is fleeting modernity, one is eternal modernity. Fleeting modernity, I mean, um, when I say fleeting modernity, I mean, um, I refer to uh, the modernity of technology, when I uh, say eternal modernity, I refer to the modernity of liberation. And this symbiotic pair has, inform, uh, has formed the central cultural contradiction of our modern world system, the system of historical capitalism. And this contradiction has never been as acute as it is today, leading to moral as well as institutional crisis. This is how the state has been designed today. I mean, there is a moral crisis, there is an institutional crisis, even in the ways in which we, we view the state today. Okay? And, and Wallerstein is particularly important in the context of the ways in which he tries, he attempts to trace the history of this con confusing symbiosis of the two modernities. Okay? On the one hand, the, the modernity of technology, and I mean the, the fleeting modernity and on the other hand, the modernity of liberation, I mean the eternal modernity. I mean, he, he uh, Wallerstein attempts to trace the, the history of, of this confusing symbiosis of, of these two modernities okay, over the history of our modern world system. Okay. Wallerstein indeed divides the, the analysis of the modern world system into three parts. One, okay, uh, uh, firstly, okay, uh, the 300 to 350 years that run between the origins of our modern world system in the middle of the 15th century to the end of the 18th century. Secondly, the 19th and most of the 20th centuries or to uh, use the two symbolic uh, dates for this second period, the era from 1789 to 1968, why he was referring to 1789, be precisely because of the French Revolution and 1968, because of the student surprising students movements in France. And the post 1968 period, which, which marked the end of liberalism as, a, as an ideology of the modern world system. Nevertheless, uh, the, the geoculture of this capitalist uh, world economy was not yet firmly in place in this first period. In the, in the period, I mean, uh, in, in, I mean that, that uh, single axial division of labor, uh, okay, uh, it is very important uh, to 
understand this 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 first i mean this this um, um, this period i mean the, the in the first period that that the axial division of labor within its uh, boundaries uh, i mean um, that uh, 19 uh, that that 300 to 350 years that run between the origins of our modern world system in the middle of the 15th century to the end of the 18th century okay this this modern world system has never uh, uh, been fully comfortable with the idea of modernity okay but for different reasons in each of the three periods that we have just now discussed that 300 to 350 years that run between the origins of our modern world system in the middle of the 15th century to the end of the 18th century okay and secondly the 19th and most of the 20th centuries or to use uh, two symbolic dates for this second period the era from uh, uh, 1789 to 1968 and the post 1968 period okay during the first period okay i mean 15th century to uh, middle of the 15th century to the end of the 18th century okay during the first period only part of the globe primarily most of europe and the americas constituted this historical system which we may call a capitalist world economy. Why capitalist world economy? Obviously, for three defining features for Immanuel Wallerstein. Number one, there existed a single axial division of labor within its boundaries with a polarization between, between core like and peripheral economic activities due to the improved modes of production of the core of the, of the colonize col, colonial countries i mean colonizers okay not colonized nations but colonizers secondly the principal political structures the states were linked together within and constrained by an interstate system whose boundaries matched those of the axial division of labor and those who pursued the ceaseless accumulation of capital prevailed in the middle uh, uh, run over those who did not. Okay. Nevertheless, the geoculture of this capitalist world system, world economy was not yet firmly in place in the first period. Indeed, this was a period in which for the parts of the world located within the capitalist world economy, there were no clear geocultural norms. There, were, there existed no social consensus even a minimal one about such fundamental issues as whether the states should be secular or not i mean the states will have reasoning capacity or not uh, in whom the moral location of sovereignty was invested the legitimacy of partial corporate autonomy of intellectuals or the social permissibility of multiple religions if if cultural contradictions Okay. If, if there was any cultural contradiction, it was the capitalist world economy uh, that was functioning um, economically and politically within a framework okay, that lacked the necessary geoculture to sustain it and, and reinforce it. Okay. The overall system thus was maladapted to its uh, own dynamic thrusts. Okay. It may be thought of as uncoordinated or as struggling against itself. The continuing dilemma of the system was geocultural. Okay? It required a major adjustment of if the capitalist world economy were to thrive and expand in the way its internal logic required. And the second period from 1789 to 1968. Okay? Okay? Uh, I mean, it was the French Revolution that forced the issue, not merely for France, but for the modern world system as a whole. Okay? The idea of justice, the idea of liberty, the idea of equality, I mean, they were the uh, hallmarks of the French Revolution, freedom, justice and so on. The French Revolution, of, of, of course, was not an isolated event. It was bounded by the decolonization of the Americas, the settler decolonizations of British North America, Hispanic America and Brazil, uh, the slave revolution of Haiti, 
uh, and the abortive Native American uprisings such as Tupac, Amaru in Peru. The French Revolution connected with and stimulated struggles for liberation of various kinds and national legions throughout Europe and around its edges, from Ireland to Russia, from Spain to Egypt. Above all, the French Revolution made it apparent in some ways for the first time the modernity of technology and the modernity of liberation were not identical. Fleeting modernity and, and, and eternal modernity are not identical. Indeed, it might be said that those who wanted primarily the modernity of technology suddenly took fright at the strength of the advocates of the modernity of liberation. Okay. Fleeting modernity, uh, I mean the proponents of fleeting modernity suddenly took fright at the strength of the advocates of the eternal modernity. Okay. In, the, in the 19th century, core zones, I mean developed countries, capitalist countries, core zones of the capitalist world economy, uh, I mean in the 19th century, okay, liberal ideology translated in itself into three principal objectives. I mean how the, 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 the aspects of modernity were, were uh, I mean were getting the roots. Okay. One was three principal political objectives when I say, I refer to the universal suffrage system, I mean universal franchise, okay, the welfare state and, and national identity, I mean citizens. Okay. I mean the, the, the combination of these three suffrage, welfare state, national identity, the combination of the three, uh, I mean the combination of which liberals hoped, the proponents of liberalism hope, uh, uh, hoped would, would achieve the objective of appeasing the dangerous classes which nonetheless ensuring the modernity of technology. Okay. Uh, the great ideology of the 19th century, I mean I refer to socialism, accepted the inevitability and desirability of progress. Socialists were suspicious of uh, top down reform. Okay. They were impatient for the full benefits of modernity, the modernity of technology to be sure, but even more the modernity of liberalism. They suspected quite correctly that the liberals intended liberalism to be limited both in its scope of application and in the persons to whom it was intended to apply. That is why socialism was very important in the context of, of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. The third phase, I mean the post 1968 phase in that the world revolution of 1968 flamed up and then subsided or rather had a profound impact on the geoculture. For 1968 shook the dominance of the liberal ideology in the geoculture of, geo of the modern world system. It thereby reopened the, the questions that the triumph of liberalism in the 19th century had closed out or, or relegated. Uh, to the margins of public debate. The, the dismantling of socialism in the erstwhile USSR and the East European landscape during 1989 and uh, uh, to 1991 obviously requires critical examination because they were the ones who, who, who questioned uh, uh, both these modernities, both these quests of modernity, uh, both these discourses on modernity. I, have, I mean both fleeting modernity as well as eternal modernity, both modernity of technology as well as modernity of liberation and the modernity of lib technology had transformed the world's social structure in ways that threatened to destabilize the social and economic underpinnings of the capitalist world economy. And the ideological history of the world system was then a memory that affected the current ability of the dominant strata to maintain political stability in, in the world system. Okay. For, for Wallerstein, we must engage in an enormous worldwide multilogue for the solutions are by no means evident. And those who wish to continue the present under the guises of uh, are, are very uh, powerful and 
and for for wallerstein if 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 it marks the end of modernity it marks obviously the end of what kind of modernity for for wallerstein for wallerstein let it be the uh, end of false modernity uh, and the onset for the first time of a true modernity of uh, liberation not the kind of modernity of liberation that the liberals uh, were propounding for rather uh, a true modernity of liberation where there will be no power structures okay where will, there will be no difference between the owners of the means of production and and those who who are owned uh, classes okay now we'll we'll quickly move on to on to uh, the 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 second key thinker in in uh, in this uh, uh, module and that is i mean synthesizing modernity and social theory i mean now how how anthony giddens okay tried to uh, look at how to synthesize modernity and social theory but quickly we'll revisit what we have discussed in wallerstein quickly in a couple of minutes okay in wallerstein's reflections on synthesis uh, uh, synthesizing modernity and social theory we have discussed how wallerstein's uh, um, the modern world system was influenced by karl marx uh, the proponents of dependency theory including um, andre gunder frank and and french historian fernand brodel and how he was very much influenced by uh, the anti colonial movements in in india as well as africa a world revolution of 1968 in france okay and how uh, uh, wallerstein argued uh, in several works that this this 1968 revolution marked the end of liberalism as a viable ideology in the modern world system he 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 astutely wallerstein astutely uh, anticipated the conflicts between the the nor northern hemisphere on the one hand and southern hemisphere on the other he rejects the notion of the third world claiming that there is only one world connected by a complex network of economic exchange relationships that is a world economy or or a world system in which the dichotomy of capital and labor and the endless accumulation of capital by competing agents account for frictions this approach is known as uh, the world systems theory by wallerstein wallerstein uh, went beyond the core periphery distinction uh, uh, propounded by uh, 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 dependency theorists including frank uh, and he he um, foregrounded another zone called semi periphery uh, and and the way uh, the expansion of the world system uh, is the continuing modific uh, commodification of things including human labor i mean natural resources land labor and human relationships are gradually being stripped of their intrinsic value and turned into commodities in a market which dictates their exchange value and so on we have also discussed how uh, wallerstein um, reflected on the uh, capitalist world system four periphery semi periphery and and lastly how wallerstein looked at modernity of technology and modernity of liberation when i say modernity of technology i refer to fleeting modernity uh, when i say uh, modernity of liberation i refer to uh, eternal modernity okay and and wallerstein astutely uh, looked at uh, mm, uh, a true modernity of liberation okay by by displacing modernity of technology which is, which is uh, a fleeting modernity okay uh, wallerstein always tried to look at eternal modernity okay then when we look at this okay in this lecture before before we start with anthony giddens okay we'll try to first of all discuss the distinction between modernity and post modernity okay because before we we start with um, uh, giddens then habermas 
because um, and then we'll again we'll discuss uh, in the context of deconstruction of modernity the works of Foucault and so on. It is very important to look at uh, postmodernism precisely because the works of Giddens as well as Habermas have significant implications for the ways in which postmodernism gave a rebuff gave uh, uh, I mean postmodern the ways in which postmodernism tried to challenge the the critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Okay. For modern for the proponents of modernity or for the proponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology, okay, there is always a foundation okay, as against the proponents of theological stage, metaphysical stage and so on, okay, uh, as against the proponents of theology and metaphysics, the way modernist suggested that no, there is always social fragmentation, dispersal, okay. there is a foundation through which we can there may be multiple foundations of course, no doubt about it okay. through which knowledge is produced and disseminated as against theology or uh, metaphysics because theology suggested that knowledge is produced only through supernatural forces. Metaphysics proponents of metaphysics suggested that you know, knowledge is produced only by na naturally mediating agencies. Okay. But, but the proponents of modernity suggested that you no know, knowledge is, is produced through human agency, through the contact of human beings with nature, with uh, through the contacts between human beings with other human beings. Okay. There is social fragmentation and, and dispersal. But postmodernists, on the contrary, they suggested that no, there is an epistemological crisis, there is, mm, there is a foundational crisis, there is no foundation of knowledge production, okay. uh, there is, it cannot be established, whether knowledge is produced through what, we do not know and whatever claims that you are making is wrong. Modernists, secondly, they, the modernists argue that there is a dialectic of dispersal and global linkages. If there is a dialectic, there is that lies a dialectic of dispersal and globalization, postmodernists argue that uh, argue in favor of centri centrifugal tendencies and dislocation. When I when I say centrifugal tendencies and dislocation, okay, I, I, I refer to the way globalization has ultimately resulted in 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 the way indigenous people and indigenous knowledge systems have been dislocated from their habitat. Modernists argue that the self is active and reflexive. Please look back those four critical pillars of modernity, holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. We not only I mean self uh, not only is self knowing important, but self creating is equally important. We must be reflexive we must carry out social and political movements, we must be rationalists. Okay. The self must is active and human agency is active and reflexive. Whereas, postmodernists argue that what is the significance of the self in the context of capitalism, in the context of globalization, the self is already dissolved and dismembered. There is no significance of the self human agency in this phase of capital in this phase of globalization the self is always dictated by by the by the powers that be by the power structures again modernists argue that globalization will produce more universality and so systemic systematic knowledge is still possible postmodernists on the contrary argue that what is universalist what is what kind of universality you are talking about knowledge is not any knowledge you talk about is not universal truth is not universal knowledge is not universal science is not universal modernity is not universal everything is context specific everything is partial truths are knowledge forms of knowledge sciences modernities they are historically conditioned they are context specific modernists argue that there is a dialectic between powerlessness and empowerment in the context of 
synthesizing modernity and social theory in the context of capitalism, in the context of globalization and so on. Postmodernists argue that where do I see any kind of empowerment? There is always powerlessness in the context of capitalism, in the context of capitalist mode of production, in the context of globalization. We do not see any trace of, we, we do not see an, even an iota of empowerment in the age of capitalism. Modernists argue further that our daily life is a complex of reactions to abstract systems, okay. whereas postmodernists argue that no, daily life is not a complex of reactions to abstract systems, rather our daily life is replaced by abstract systems. Uh, we always talk about our economic life, political life and so on, there is no abstract system operational in, in our daily life, that is the argument of postmodernists. Modernists further argue that in capitalist, in capitalist mode of production, in globalized world, coordinated political action, organized political action carrying out social and political movements is both possible as well as necessary. Postmodernists on this count, they agree to, to some extent. They say for, for postmodernists, yes, coordinated political action, carrying out organized social and political movements is necessary, no doubt about it, but is not possible. Political action is impossible because of contextuality because postmodernists reject the idea of epistemology, foundation, indivi the individual, the self, okay, uh, ethics okay, uh, and universality. For modernists, what is postmodernity? For modernists, postmodernist, uh, postmodernity implies moving beyond modernity, maybe from capitalism to socialism, from from this kind of life to a good life and so on. But for, for postmodernists, this is not moving beyond modernity. For postmodernists, postmodernity marks the end of epistemology, the end of foundation, the end of universality, the end of the individual, the end of ethics. This is very important. When we look at this, that the distinction between, between modernity and, and postmodernism, I mean such distinctions between modernity and postmodernism have significant implications for the ways in which we are going to look at the, the contributions of, of Anthony Giddens to start with and, and subsequently uh, the contributions of uh, Eugen Habermas uh, subsequently. Uh, assume greater significance. The, the implications of such distinctions assume greater significance in the context of the contributions made by um, Giddens and Habermas. Okay. In the next lecture, we are going to start with, with, with uh, Giddens. Okay. Then, I mean in Giddens, we will discuss um, uh, structuration theory, I mean uh, the, the relationship with duality of the structure, okay. uh, but, but when uh, and, and uh, then we will also discuss time space distanciation and so on, but when we discuss these, these such distinctions between modernity and postmodernism, okay, there is a difference, okay. difference in the sense I just uh, Anyway, this is not a part of this course, but I will just tell you uh, very quickly, um, uh, you can, you can, those who want to do uh, further studies on this, on these uh, theories, social political theories can look at this. Okay. Suppose Jack Derrida, okay. Derrida was a French, uh, I mean uh, 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 philosopher, uh, linguist, uh, sociologist and so on. Okay. Okay. He coined the term difference, not difference, okay. difference. Okay. It, is a, it is a central concept in Derrida's deconstruction, a critical outlook concerned with the relationship between text and meaning. Postmodernists also look at 
the relationship between text and meaning ok. Not that they try to cull out meaning from the text. No, what is the relationship between the text and meaning? Difference, not difference, difference also refers to conceptual differentiation between uh, uh, differentiation and deferral of or postponing of meaning in processes of signification. What is signifier? What is signified? We will discuss these things later. Difference hence refers simultaneously to the entire configuration of its meanings. Okay. Postmodernists also look at those things, the relationship between, between text and meaning. Okay. Then in this lecture, we, we have covered the, the entire uh, contributions of uh, uh, contributions made by uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein and the distinction between uh, modernity and uh, postmodernism and such distinctions between modernity and postmodernism uh, uh, as you, I have you know, told you earlier that have significant implications for the ways in which Anthony Giddens and um, Jürgen Habermas uh, have attempted to reflect on synthesizing modernity and social theory. Okay? In the next lecture, we are going to discuss uh, Giddens contributions to, to the whole debate on uh, how to synthesize modernity and social theory. Thank you.